In the field of inferential statistics, there are two big heavy hitters. There's confidence intervals, which we learned in chapter nine, what we learned the first two confidence intervals. And then there's hypothesis tests, which we're going to learn in chapter 10. Well, again, we're going to learn the first two hypothesis tests. And as we keep going into chapter 11, you'll learn, oh, there's lots more. You can do lots and lots of different confidence intervals, lots and lots of different hypothesis tests. This is what you would do in chapters 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, if you kept going. Nothing but confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. So if hypothesis tests are a really big deal, then we're going to spend a section basically developing the concept of a hypothesis test, as well as the language involved with hypothesis testing. We're not actually going to run a hypothesis test yet. We're going to wait on that until section 10.2, but we're going to learn the basics of what's going on in 10.1. All right, so let's begin with an exploratory example. And this example will kind of be a good reference for us throughout the rest of the course, so that we can kind of remind ourselves how this works. So let's suppose, suppose we're going to roll a six-sided die like this, and we're going to roll it 12 times. So either you can use a physical die or you can use online, um, an online die simulator, and there's a link to one if you're interested. Now you're going to count the number of fives that you roll. So you would roll it, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Oops, I got a five. Six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, whoop, I got another one, there's two, and 12. So I got two, but you would roll whatever you get. Let me show you the online dice simulator in case you're interested. All right, so on random.org, and this is just one of many dice simulators you can find online, I could say, hey, I wanna roll 12 dice, right? And then I can say, roll the dice, and it will tell me what the dice are, and I can count how many fives there are in there. Oh, there's one. So that one was a one, and then I could roll it again. And then there's a one and another one, so that's two, right? Oh, three, there's three there, one, two, three. So there were three fives on that one. So you can see, oh, okay, you know, we, we could do this over and over and over. And in a class, we have everybody do it, right? All right, so I did have a class do it, and these are the results they came up with. So let me show you this to you. So it was five that had no five, or fives at all. Right, so five different rolls had nothing, no fives. Three different times had one five. Yes, these are real results. This was a real class uh, from the f winter of 2020, as a matter of fact. Ah, you thought I was going to put a zero in there, didn't you? Ah, but I didn't. This was a student who got all 12 fives. So when they rolled, it was just five, 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 every time. Hmm. So this was a student we're going to call Steve. Steve had those results. Actually, I'm going to put that, ah, I'll leave it there. Now, what are some conclusions we could draw from these results? Hmm. All right, so in class when this happens, <laughs> students usually come up with um, some things pretty quickly. So one, Steve is a liar, right? Hmm, it, and this happens actually a lot. When it's a male student, especially, they'll be like, he's a liar, he's a cheat, right? And then some people like, give Steve the benefit of the doubt. Steve's result just happened, right? So Steve's result just randomly happened. It's possible, right? Or, and then this is going to take us a moment. When you think about a six-sided die like this, the probability of a five is one out of six. This is actually a binomial setup. Remember binomial? So we can make a little note. Um, I guess I'll just kind of do it up here. So note, this is a binomial experiment. That's why I tell you how many times to roll because N is 12, P, your probability of success is one sixth, right? Hmm. So there is another option, right? So Steve could be a liar and it, or a cheater, right? Steve could just have randomly had this happen to him, in which case we need to take him to a casino right away because he's, he's really lucky, right? Or, right, so this is kind of 
luck, right? He was lucky. And then the other option is that the probability that we assumed was not true. I mean, when you think about these dice rollers, you're just assuming, oh yeah, one sixth of the time, it'll be a five, right? But that's not always the case. Hmm. Now, if these categories are looking familiar to you, ah, that's because you've learned them before. This one would be a biased sample. If he's going to cheat or lie, then his results are biased, right? Because he, he was not trustworthy to begin with, right? This lucky fluke, right? By random chance, it just happened. That's a fluke. Is this sounding familiar from chapter eight? Yes. Or the parameter that we assumed is wrong. Right? Those are the three options. Now, here's the problem. Bias sample gives us nothing. If, you're, if your sample is biased, you're not really in this class because we can't really deal with biased samples. If the person's going to lie about the results, eh, we got nothing. Right? So we kind of toss that one just out, just in general, because we, we don't have any way to mathematically deal with that. So that leaves us these two options. So is it possible that his result is a fluke? Absolutely it's possible. But is it likely? Right? Is, is there a high probability? Hmm. Well, <laughs> that's a different story. So there's two main methods for drawing a conclusion about what's going on here. And I'll give you a hint. The conclusion we're going to draw is this. Right? This is the conclusion we're going to go with. Right? So we're going to say, look, bias samples out because you know, we, we just have to assume that Steve is telling us the truth, which he was, by the way. I can show you why in a little bit. Right? So we have to assume Steve is telling us the truth. If Steve is telling us the truth, then what is the evidence that we have that it's the parameter that's wrong? Okay, well, one, or excuse me, the parameter is wrong rather than the fluke, for example. One is that he is so far away from the rest of the group. His z-score would be huge, right? So his result, Steve's result of 12 fives is so far away from the rest of the group. And yes, th these are real data. This was a real student. Um, he wasn't named Steve. <laughs> Steve's my husband's name. I figured I might as well pick on him. <laughs> All right. So from the rest of the group. In fact, his Z-score, we could even find, in case you wanted to know. Um, this is a little review. Never hurts to review the binomial. If you remember, if N is 12 and P is 1 6, then the mean is NP, which would be 12 times 1 6, which would be 2. Right? I mean, if you want to say 12 times 1 6 is 2, that's fine. And the standard deviation, let's see if I can squeeze it in here. Standard deviation is the square root of NPQ. So that would be the square root of 12 times 1 6 times 5 6. And if we grab a calculator or Desmos, I'll grab Desmos. So square root, SQRT, or you can go get it out of the palette. 12 times 1 6 times 5 6. There you go, 1.29. All right, so that standard deviation is 1.29. So Steve's z score would be his value minus the mean over the standard deviation. We learned that in chapter 3. And it's probably going to be on the final exam, so it's not a bad thing to remind ourselves how to do it. So he got 12 fives, but we expected two fives, and the standard deviation was 1.29. So if we take that z-score, and if you remember, if you're doing it on the calculator, you want to put parentheses around that numerator. If you're doing it on Desmos, it'll actually show up just like you look. So if I click down here, make a little division first. So if I press divide, then it's 12 minus 2 divided by 1.29. And you can see the z-score is 7.75, 7.752. And that is crazy high. Very unusual for a z-score. I mean, we were saying back in chapter 
three that being beyond two standard deviations was unusual and this person 7.7 standard deviations unusually right so that is just very 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 high 